Honors peeps, welcome to your notes on classical Rome. Today we are going to discuss the civilization of Rome and there is a lot to cover so we're going to get right to it. So first here are our essential questions for this set of notes. First, I want you to listen for what were the major accomplishments of Rome. Next, you're going to be looking for what happened during the Punic Wars. And finally, you're going to be listening and looking for the reasons that Rome as an empire fell, or in other words, what were the reasons for the decline of Rome? So first, let's talk about Rome's early influence and geography. So the Romans were influenced by many other cultures around them, including the Latins, the Etruscans, and as you know, the Greeks. And it makes sense because they're all located near each other. So we have Etruria, the Etruscans, Latium, the Latins, right? And we know that Greece is also located nearby. So they're interacting quite a bit, and that explains why they incorporate and influence each other so much. So Rome is located in the country of Italy. Italy is part of Europe, and it, on your map, looks like a giant boot. So a lot of people call it the boot of Europe. It looks like a heeled woman's boot. And it is a peninsula, so to review your geography terms, it is surrounded by water on three sides. And that means that it is open to a lot of resources that are special that have to do with being in a peninsula. And it's also a great place to do trade with other civilizations, and you can ship things in and out easily. So Rome was built on seven different hills, and this was done for protection. They provided geographical natural barriers, which made it easy to defend from outsiders and invaders. It also had an easy route to the sea, but it was far enough from the sea to be pretty safe from pirates. So you'll see here, here's Rome. It's located inland, not right on the coast. And it also has access to the Tiber River which as we know, rivers are extremely useful. They provide good soil, they're useful for transportation and for all kinds of things. So one thing you'll notice about the Roman civilization is that throughout its history, it goes through several different types of government. So we're gonna learn a lot about different governments just from looking at Rome. So let's talk a little bit about their government. In 509 BCE, the Romans overthrew the last Etruscan king, and when they did that, they established something called a republic. Now, a republic is a type of government in which you have representatives that represent the people, and you have a leader, but the leader is not a king, so the leader doesn't have all the power. So certain citizens are allowed to vote. It's very similar to what we have in the United States today. So in the beginning, Rome was surrounded by enemies, and so they spent a lot of time conquering different territories and getting themselves on a better footing, so to speak. So this included conquering the Greeks. And whenever the Romans would conquer a group of people, they would actually allow those people to assimilate into their society. And what that means is that they would give the people that they conquered the right to become Roman citizens. So this is very different from Spartan helots. If you remember in Greece, the Spartans also did a lot of conquering and they conquered a lot of people and brought them into their city state. But when they did that, they didn't give them the same rights as their citizens, they became slaves. So this is different from what we saw in Sparta. So this shows that the Romans were pretty smart when it came to politics. And this is one reason they were so successful. And you've heard of the Roman Empire probably. So the Romans were very good diplomats. They first off let the conquered peoples that they took over become citizens, which kept them from having to deal with as many uprisings and revolts as the Greeks did. They also allowed their states to run their own internal affairs. So what that means is that when the empire grew, each area, each state would be able to handle its own issues and not necessarily always have to go back to the leadership of the entire empire to solve problems. So this was very efficient and it kept things 
from getting too chaotic and it kept the people happy. The Romans were also very good when it came to their military. They had brilliant strategists and they also had very strong persistent soldiers. So they had great leaders in their armies, but they also had great soldiers that made up the armies. And their law and politics were also very practical. So let's go a little bit deeper into the Roman power structure. So in the Roman government, there were two classes. The first upper class was called the patricians. Patricians were the ruling class. They were made up of wealthy landowners, and they were the ones that were able to vote and hold office in the government. The lower class in the Roman government was called the plebeians. And nowadays, people sometimes use this to call someone. It's kind of like when you call your friend a peasant, right? And we'll talk about peasants next unit. But the plebeians were the lower class. They were only allowed to vote, but they couldn't hold office in government. They couldn't be in the leadership of the government. So speaking of government leadership in Rome, here is how that was broken up. So you have several groups that make up the Roman government leadership. First, you have the consuls. There were two consuls that were chosen every year, and their job was to run the government and lead the army. And then you had someone called a praetor. The praetor was the person who decided how the law applied to citizens. And this specifically is what we would call civil law. Civil meaning dealing with people within your own state. Then we had some bigger groups. So one of those larger groups was the Senate. And this word should sound familiar to you because we have a Senate. So this is an example of something we borrowed from classical Rome. So the Senate in Rome was made up of 300 patricians, the wealthy landowners, and those men served for life. So they were there for the rest of their life, and then when anyone died, they would be replaced. The Senate's job was the, to advise the government officials. So they were the ones advising the consuls and the praetors, and eventually they gained the power to enforce laws. And the last group in the Roman government was the Centuriate Assembly. This was the group that elected the consuls and the praetors, and this was also the group that passed laws. Now, as you can probably tell, there was not equality between plebeians and patricians. You can guess that the plebeians did not have as much power as the patricians and that that probably didn't sit well with them. So naturally, there was a lot of conflict between these two classes. And this is what we would call a struggle of the orders. The orders being the plebeians versus the patricians. So one of the biggest beefs that they had was that the plebeians wanted the ability to serve in government offices. They wanted to be able to work in government leadership. And of course, the patricians didn't want that because they wanted to keep that power. So the plebeians were fighting against this and there had to be some sort of compromise. And the compromise that was reached was that the plebeians were given something called the Council of Plebes. And the Council of Plebes was not quite government top leadership, but it was a group that was in charge of protecting the plebeians specifically. So this is something that was designed to try to give the plebeians a little bit of comfort and feeling like they were getting some power without actually giving up any of the patricians' power. Now we come to something very important. And this is regarding law. So we talked in our ERVC notes about the first law code in history, which was written by Hammurabi of Babylon. And that was one of the earliest codes of law, and it influenced every law code that came after it. So it sort of set the stage of what a law code would look like. So now we get a second major law code called the Twelve Tables. This is applying that idea, that vocabulary term that you've been learning, rule of law. It's applying that in Rome. It was a code of laws that focused on civil laws. And these were actually called tables because they were written out on tablets and they were placed, like you see in this picture, they were placed in public meeting areas so that everyone could see them and read them. And this held the government accountable 
for following those laws and enforcing those laws, and it held the citizens accountable in the same way. So everybody knew what the law was, it was easily available. And this covered things like civil disputes, criminal issues, and even religious law. And again, the rule of law has the idea that no one is above the law. And on the flip side of that, to say it a different way, everyone is equal under the law. So whether you were a patrician or a plebeian, whether you were a council or a praetor or a, a centuriate assembly member, you were expected to follow the law and you were subject to that law. So let's review for a second. What were the two main social classes in Rome? Take a look at your notes, or better yet, try to think of it off the top of your head. If you said plebeians and patricians, you were correct. Bonus points if you can tell me which was the higher class and which was the lower class. That's right. The patricians were the higher class and the plebeians were the lower class. All right, another quiz question. What was the name of Rome's first code of laws? If you said the 12 tables, you're correct. Good job. All right, now we're going to talk about the Punic Wars. This is your second essential question for this set of notes. The Punic Wars was a series of wars fought between Rome and another civilization called Carthage. Now, Carthage was the strongest and the richest state in the area. It was a Phoenician settlement, and if you remember, the Phoenicians were the sea people. They are the ones that developed the Phoenician alphabet that was adopted by the Greeks and the Romans. And the Phoenicians were very good at seafaring of all kinds. So the Carthage was a Phoenician settlement located in North Africa in a very important commercial hub. So you can see right here is where Carthage is, and here is Rome. Now, Punic, the word Punic comes from Punicus. It's the Latin word for Phoenician. So that's why these wars were called the Punic Wars. So the Punic Wars, as I said, is a series of wars between Rome and Carthage. The first Punic War starts in 264 BCE. And here's what happens during the first Punic War. First, Rome sends an army into Sicily. And Carthage saw this as an act of war. It saw it as being aggressive. And Rome realized that in a battle with Carthage that they couldn't win unless they had a navy. And so they put together a small fleet, which is just a group of ships. And in 241 BCE, Carthage surrenders and gives up all its rights to Sicily. Now Carthage was led by this guy right here, who is named Hannibal. And Hannibal was considered the greatest Carthaginian general of all time. And he was not happy about the end result of the First Punic War, obviously. And he was determined to strike back. So another Punic War begins, and this is started when Hannibal enters Europe through Spain by crossing the Alps. And he does this in one of my favorite ways possible. He rides in on elephants, y'all. All right, so he comes in through Spain to get into Europe. And the Romans meet up with the Carthaginians at a place called Cannae. And here is where Rome takes a huge hit and they lose over 40,000 men. Now Rome continues to reconquer some of the territories that had been taken from them. And eventually in 206 BCE, they push the Carthaginians out of Spain. So then in 202 BCE, there is another battle called the Battle of Zama. Here is when Rome really becomes top dog in the Western Mediterranean area. So they are successful and they establish themselves as the most powerful civilization in the Mediterranean. So their final conquest comes 50 years later and the Romans finally destroy the Carthaginians in the Third Punic War. So the Carthaginians fight hard, but they lose the Punic Wars to Rome. Now this is not to say that everything was great in Rome. Rome was having its own issues. One of those issues was that there was a lot of inequality in Rome, and that led people to become angry, and it led to general unrest. So one thing that bothered people was that the Senate 
began to become too powerful. So it was not representing Rome as a whole. It was only representing the upper echelons, the upper class. So, for example, lower class farmers weren't able to compete with the wealthy landowners. They couldn't keep up with them, and so they kept losing their farms. So then along come these two brothers. These are Gaius and Tiberius Gracchus, and they are aristocrats, so they are upper class, but they're brothers who wanted to try to fix the situation. They were trying to come up with a solution for the growing economic and social crisis that was happening in Rome. So what happens is that they believe that all of this stems from this problem with the small farmers losing their farms to the wealthy landowners. And so what they decided to do to try to fix this issue was they passed land reform bills that would take land from the rich and give it back to the poor. Now any guesses who wouldn't like this plan? You're right, the wealthy landowners aren't going to like that at all. So the Senate, which is made up of mostly wealthy landowners, does not like this idea from the Gracchus brothers. So they have them both killed. Then in 107 BCE, a new Roman army is established. This is because of a new Roman general named Marius. Marius recruited volunteers from the urban and rural poor, and he promises to give them land. So what happens is that now the soldiers of the army are not loyal to the government, they're loyal to Marius, to their general. And the generals had to get involved in politics in order to get things that they needed for their army. So Marius, who is just, he starts off as a, a military leader, becomes involved in politics. And he has this interest in politics purely because he's promised this land to his soldiers and he's got to keep that promise or he's going to lose them and lose their loyalty. So then you have a power struggle starting. Okay, so we have another leader named Lucius Cornelius Sulla who comes along in 82 BCE. And he is going to take advantage of Marius's new army. So he and Marius start fighting over the army because they realize that having control of the army is going to be extremely politically important. So Sulla takes over Rome to win and restore power to the Senate. And basically he tries to get rid of the popular assembly. So what he's doing is taking over the army and using that to seize power. And this is something that you're going to see repeated throughout history. It's something that becomes very common, a common way to seize power in a country that is in a state of change and flux. So this is the collapse of the Roman Republic. It happens over the next three years in Roman history. And it is a time of civil war and civil unrest. And you have three leaders who emerge as the victors here. So they are Caesar, Crassus, and Pompey. And these three leaders form a small group of leaders called a triumvirate. right? And tri meaning there's three of them. So they are in charge in sharing equal power of Rome. And this is established in 60 BCE. Now, as you might guess, three leaders may not work so well because, you, as we know, People in general, humans in general, when they get power, they like to have more of it. They like to keep that power. They don't like to share it, generally. So what happens when they're trying to share power is that they'll split up territories conquered by Rome. So, for example, Pompey is given control over Spain. Crassus is controlling Syria. And Caesar is in control of Gaul, which is now France. So Caesar, in particular gains a lot of notoriety as a successful military leader. Now, here's where things get sticky. You have these three leaders, but then Crassus, one of the three, ends up dying in a battle. And when he dies, there are only two guys left, and the Senate wants Pompey and Caesar to lay down their weapons, but Caesar refuses. Caesar sees an opportunity to take control. So he marches into Rome and starts a civil war. And in 45 BCE, he becomes dictator of Rome. And a dictator is a leader who takes over their control. They are not elected. 
They take over control and become the sole power in their country or in their civilization. So he has all the power to himself. Now Caesar had a lot of plans. He had wanted to go out east and he wanted to build great buildings. But the next year after he becomes dictator, a group of senators plan and execute his assassination. So they end up surrounding and killing him and stabbing him to death. So after the collapse of the Roman Republic and the assassination of Caesar, who had become dictator, a second triumvirate is set up. And this is made up of three different leaders, Octavian, Antony, and Lepidus. Antony had control over the East and Octavian controlled most of the West, and Lepidus wasn't as powerful as those two. So Antony and Octavian come into conflict with each other when Antony falls in love with the Egyptian leader Cleopatra, the queen of Egypt. So Octavian and Antony's forces start clashing in 31 BCE, and Antony and his girlfriend Cleopatra have to flee back to Egypt. So when Antony flees back to Egypt with Cleopatra, Octavian is named by the Senate as the new leader, and Octavian becomes known as Augustus. So he becomes Emperor Augustus in 31 BCE, and he is known for doing a lot of great things for Rome. For instance, he brings back the Senate to bring a more representative type of government. He improves military prowess, and he becomes named Imperator of Rome. So he decides he wants to reform the army, probably wants to get their loyalty back to the government where he believes it belongs and not to the generals in the army. And he also is working on stabilizing the frontiers of his territory. So as an empire expands, as the territory expands and the territory that your civilization has conquered gets bigger and bigger, becomes harder to protect your borders and to control things. So he's working on trying to bring stability on the borders. So now Rome is established as an empire. And an empire is when you have your central state or civilization, but you now have conquered other civilizations around it and you're expanding outward. So the new political system under Emperor Augustus allowed him to choose his successor, who was going to be next in line to be the emperor. And every time this happened, though, each new emperor would slowly take a little bit more power from the Senate and give it to themselves. So you're going to see that in the beginning, it's okay, and these are good emperors, and it seems to be working well. Okay, so we have five really good emperors in a row. That's Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, Antoninus Pius, and Marcus Aurelius. So these five guys are back-to-back -back great emperors for Rome, very successful, do a lot of things to help the people of Rome and to stabilize their empire. So this whole time period of these five guys being in power, which goes from 96 AD all the way to 180 AD, is called the Pax Romana. And that just, that's what we call this time period, the Pax Romana. And the word Pax means peace. And obviously Romana is relating to Rome. So basically it is a time of peace in Rome when everything was going pretty well. So a couple more things that I want to point out that happened during the Pax Romana. Each of these leaders treated the ruling class with respect. This was smart politics because you want your ruling class to be happy enough that they're not going to try to overthrow you and get rid of you. Look what happened to Caesar, right? If you ignore their happiness or well-being or what they want, then you're going to get in trouble. Um, and again, remember, there's more of them than there are of you. They also got rid of arbitrary execution. So as you know what execution is, but you might not know what arbitrary means. Arbitrary means without a good reason, just kind of random. So instead of just executing people left and right, they only did it when they felt it was necessary. And the most important thing they did was they maintained peace in their empire for a long time. Now remember though that the power of the emperor continued to expand and the emperor started getting more and more power and the senate was losing power so that he could gain it. So we're becoming less 
representative of the people as time goes on. Okay, now let's talk about some of the contributions that the civilization of Rome made to culture. Some of the things that we get from Rome that you still see around the world today are influences in art, architecture, and literature. Now, remember though that much of what we see in Rome in the classic era was borrowed and copied from the Greeks. So you can see, for example, here, this architecture does look very Greek. Um, but it is, it's very similar to what we saw in Greece. Now, some of the things, though, that Rome did really, really well was they created new types of buildings. They built very impressive and durable roads. And they also built an aqueduct. And an aqueduct is something that carries water a long distance. So when your civilization, if it is not close to a water source, you can build an aqueduct and carry that water further so that you don't have to necessarily settle right on the water. And this aqueduct is still here today that you can see that was built centuries ago by the Romans. Now, finally, we also see a lot of contributions from Rome to literature. So you see a lot of writing from authors like Virgil, Horace, and Livy. Some are about Rome, some are satires, some are historical writings, but a lot of great writing came out of classical Rome. Now let's talk a little bit about the family. In Roman society, families were patriarchal, which means that they were led by men, and children were raised at home. Boys and girls learned how to read in ancient Rome. Their teachers were slaves from Greece, so the Greeks were teaching Roman children Greek and Latin, because those were languages that were commonly used throughout the empire. Girls did learn, get to learn to read, but they didn't do as much as the boys. Boys also learned writing. They learned about morals and moral principles. They learned family values, law, and they did physical training. And at the age of 16, boys traded in their purple lined toga that they would wear and they would be given a solid white toga. And so this is something we commonly associate with Rome and Greece is the, this style of dress. So a toga is just a long piece of fabric that was wrapped around a certain way and it was like, kind of looks like a robe. And so a white toga represented manhood. Now women in Rome had to have male guardians, which is very similar to one of the city-states in ancient Greece. Second century women lost the need for their male guardians later and had a larger part in society, but early on they had to have a male guardian. Now let's think about how this compares to classical Greece. Which city-state in classical Greece also required women to have a male guardian? If you said Athens, then you are correct. All right, so continuing in looking at society in classical Rome. So remember, there was a huge gap between the rich and the poor, the upper and lower classes. The poor usually lived in apartments called insulates, and these were not built very well. Think about it. Apartments weren't necessarily things that had been around for very long. They were not planned very well. They were built very quickly, and so they often collapsed. Public buildings and temples, though, were very impressive in Rome. For example, the Colosseum was a stadium where many different events were often held, the most famous of which were the gladiatorial games. So gladiators were men that were fighters that would be brought into the Colosseum and they would fight in public battles, often to the death, purely for entertainment purposes. So this is something that the Romans just lived for. Think about Super Bowl Sunday in the United States. And that stadium is packed full of fans that are screaming at the top of their lungs. This was what the Colosseum was for Rome. Now we get to the end of the Roman Empire. So there are a lot of things that bring an end to the Roman Empire as we know it. Some would argue it starts in 284 AD, and this is when the empire was split into two parts so that it could be governed more effectively. Because remember, the bigger your empire gets, the harder it is to keep track of everything. So it was split, and there was the Western Empire and the Eastern Empire. 
each of those had different leaders trying to govern them. But that doesn't always work out well, even though it sounds like a great idea. Sometimes you start to have differences between those two parts that cause conflict. So one thing that happens is that the emperors that are in charge of Rome over these next few generations of leadership become weaker and more corrupt. So they are less effective and they're less trustworthy. And that is going to cause many issues for the Roman Empire. Economically, the bigger the empire has gotten, the harder and more costly it is to defend it from rivals and invaders from outside. And also just to keep things running smoothly, right? It costs a lot of money to run a country or to run a civilization. So the emperors started increasing taxes, but that caused two problems. It caused a lot of people to lose their jobs and not be able to keep up with their taxes. And so they're economically strained as citizens. And it also causes inflation. And inflation is something that happens in an economy when you overproduce your money, you're printing more and more money to try to take care of things. But by doing that, that money becomes worth less. Another part of the fall of Rome relates to military decline. So as the empire expanded, eventually Roman armies started relying more and more on mercenaries, which are paid soldiers. And basically, these were people who were not from Rome. They were non-Romans. And so they weren't very loyal to the empire. They were just in it for the money. And so if they didn't get their money, which we have some economic problems in Rome, they're going to start getting paid less, their loyalty will not stay. And they are eventually not going to defend Rome very well. So eventually, due to that issue, there are more and more invasions in the late 300s. Rome is constantly being attacked by these tribes from Northern Europe and Central Asia, like the Goths and the Huns. And eventually these tribes are going to successfully invade Rome. Now the Romans called any group that wasn't like them, that was very different from them, they just called them barbarians. And it was because they're like, oh, they all sound the same, bar, 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 bar. So that's where that barbarian name comes from. And nowadays, when you hear someone call someone a barbarian, it's usually not a compliment. And it's usually referring to them as uncivilized or less civilized. So after that, it's just chaos all throughout the Roman Empire. And this goes on for years until Rome is finally sacked or taken over. Think of like sacking a quarterback, right? You knock him out. You, you attack him and you defeat him. So Rome is sacked in 476 AD. And this is the official marker in history of the end of the Roman Empire and the end of the classical era. And it also marks the beginning of our next era called the medieval period or the Middle Ages.